Hi there, my name is Jack Wallen, and this is Linux 101, but it is a special edition of Linux 101. Essentially, it's a bonus video, because I usually don't do these videos until Thursday. It is Saturday, almost Christmas. But this video in particular was inspired by something that happened. And it wasn't a good something. And it's something that I feel needs to be addressed. Here's what happened. So recently, I wrote a review of a Linux distribution called Wubuntu, which I actually mentioned in my last video. I tested the distribution. I usually test them for about a week before I write about them. And everything was fine. It looked good. It, it performed well. It, it looked like a distribution that anyone who was accustomed to Windows 11 could jump to and have a fairly easy time with. Well, it was pointed out that Wubuntu was actually a rebranding of Linux FX. Now, you might not know this, and it's understandably why you might not know this, but Linux FX is not exactly the best crayon in the box, to say it nicely. A lot of people considered it to be malicious in certain ways, but effectively what it boils down to was with Linux effects. There was a tool called, within the distribution called Power Tools, and you, you could purchase a license for Power Tools, and it added extra features to the distribution. Well, here's the thing. So the developer behind Linux effects stored all the information for the purchases of Power Tools on a basically a flat text file that was accessible from a website, which means that your information could have easily been stolen. And there were other issues with Linux FX. So when that was pointed out to me, I started digging into it. And at first, I couldn't find any link between Linux FX and Ubuntu. So I got curious, so I sent an e email to the developer. And their response was kind of non-committal. That essentially they kept saying that Ubuntu is Ubuntu with a special KDE skin, KDE Plasma being a desktop environment. And I kept kind of trying to be direct and I kept getting indirect answers. So I, I, I continued to do some research and even on the Ubuntu site, there's a link. If you go to the, 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 the Ubuntu SourceForge page, there's a link to, to a Linux FX KDE Plasma skin or theme. Now, you can put two and two together. I'm not going to make any grand declarations that Ubuntu is, in fact, malicious. I'm not saying that. Ubuntu could very easily be perfectly safe, but because it has links to a known problematic distribution, you can see why it's a little iffy. And to the point where I retracted my review of Ubuntu and rewrote a piece saying why I can't recommend it. And here's where this leads to with my Linux 101 series. When I first started covering Linux and open source back in 99, the year of Prince is what I like to call it, there was a certain unspoken rule within the open source community that everything created within that community is safe. Linux was safe. All of the open source tools that were used with Linux was safe. And there was no reason to question that. And I, I remember back then, it didn't matter where the application came from, who the developer was that created it. I trusted that I could download it. At the time it was downloading the source, I could compile it and everything was fine. I wasn't vetting anything. I was just, hey, I need this, download it, compile it, run it, good, awesome, I have a new application. And that continued for years, for years. I would add whatever repository to my Linux distribution, 
third party, single developer, it didn't matter. I would add those repositories, install the applications, and woohoo, we're good to go. Fast forward to now. I don't trust it anymore. I, I mean, let me say that again. I don't trust as willingly as I used to. Why? Because it really only takes one bad apple to ruin it for everyone. And when this whole thing came up with Ubuntu and Linux FX, the first thing that came to my mind is we can't have nice things. Now, this is not limited to, to Linux. There are bad actors attacking everything. And here's, here's what's really kind of disconcerting about this. The more you know two things, the more frightened you are and the more you realize you don't know enough because there is so much to know, to, you need to know. And I, I kind of miss those days where I could just willy-nilly trust anything and install it. But I don't. For instance, take for instance, I'm an Android user. Essentially, with Android, I only install the applications that I absolutely have to have. Other than that, I don't install anything. Why? Because I'm, I don't want to install malware on my, my, my phone. I use my phone for sensitive data, and I don't want malware stealing that information. Same thing with, with Mac OS and Linux. I don't install just anything anymore. If it doesn't come from an official repository, or it hasn't been vetted by open source peers all over the place, I'm not going to install it. And it makes me sad that we've come to this point, that the open source community can't be trusted in the way it used to. Because it used to be the whole of the open source landscape was a trustworthy place. But enough bad actors have infiltrated to where I can't say that anymore, and it's upsetting. Linux is still very secure, very safe to use, very safe. But here's what I'm going to say. If you're new to Linux, if you're interested in using Linux, and I mean this, I'm, I'm very serious about this. If you are interested in using Linux, stick with the mainstream distributions, period. That means Ubuntu, Linux Mint, Fedora, OpenSUSE, Elementary OS. There are a handful of others. Like, for instance, I fully trust Zorin OS, and I have actually paid for the pro license of Zorin OS. I fully trust Bodhi Linux. I've had a lot of discussions with the developer of Bodhi Linux. Good guy. And there are plenty of other distributions that are trustworthy. And, and here's another example. Deepin. Deepin Linux. When Deepin Linux first came onto the market, it blew everybody away because it was gorgeous. The desktop was absolutely stunning. And then all of a sudden, people started to dig in and discover that, well, a lot of information that you're transmitting is being sent to untrustworthy places. So people stopped using Deepin. And then the people behind Deepin started to say, oh, no, 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 we're safe, we're safe, you don't have to worry about us, we're good, we're good. But even still, you install Deepin like deep in Linux, and you open the App Store, and you'll see all sorts of apps that are questionable. Now, you can install the Deepin desktop on, say, Ubuntu, and you're pretty good to go. It shouldn't be this way. And if you are using Linux for malicious purposes, shame on you. Shame, shame, shame. And the problem is, 
it's not just on the desktop. People are starting to target Linux on the, in the enterprise environment. And, and listen, listen to this. You might not know this, you might not believe this, but if it weren't for open source software, we wouldn't have things like Amazon, Netflix, Hulu, Spotify, Slack, you name it. You name it and it uses open source software. That, my friends, is a guarantee. The world depends on open source software. And to those people who are using open source software for nefarious purposes, you are a discredit to developers and the open source community everywhere. Now again, I'm not saying that Wubuntu is dangerous to use. I'm saying I don't know if I trust it. And from this point on, when I go to review a Linux distribution, you can be sure I'm going to look into it first. Well, I mean, I look into them anyway, but I'm going to dig a little deeper and, and I'm, going to start, I'm going to start questioning if a distribution that I'm about to review can be trusted or if a piece of software that I'm about to review can be trusted. And it goes much further than this. Let me, let me post something to you, okay? And this might be something you've never thought of. Many of the devices that we buy today, headphones, earbuds, gimbals, cameras, you name it, they all require apps. And many of those apps require accounts. And many of those apps that require accounts are developed in China. I think you know where I'm going with this. I'm not going to say it out loud, but I think you know where I'm going with this. Do you trust those apps? Should you trust those apps? Ultimately, what I'm trying to say is always err on the side of caution. It's just like the same reason why you don't use Windows without antivirus, anti-malware, and a firewall. Now, the good thing is, is Windows comes with Windows Defender, which is it's a good piece of software. But if, it, if it's turned off, all bets are off. You never know what's going to happen. Now, Linux, you don't need antivirus and anti-malware. And you can use a firewall all you want. But the problem is now, can we trust the software that we're installing? And again, it's not just Linux. It's everywhere. It's Linux, Mac, Windows, Android, iOS, iPad OS, even embedded systems. IOT devices can be hacked. Your thermostat can be hacked if you're not careful, if your network is insecure. We live in a world where you always have to be ahead of the game. But the problem is those hackers have a vested interest in being two or three steps ahead of you, me, and everybody else. And we depend on companies and developers to release software that is secure and vetted without back doors. Look, I thought Ubuntu was good. Used it for a week, seemed good. Then after all of these reports came in, I fired the virtual machine back up and guess what? A pop-up appeared, a full screen pop-up appeared, requiring a license for power tools. I never even opened power tools and I couldn't use the desktop without entering a license key and I would have to purchase it. Now the developer sent me a free license key 
and said that I was using the Pro version. I wasn't using the Pro version. I was using the regular version. Trust. Trust used to be something I threw around like Monopoly money. But now, not so much. And that it's happening within the open source community is heartbreaking. I cannot tell you how many articles that I've written over the last 20 plus years where I've blankly stated you can 100% trust Linux and open source software. I don't know if I could say that anymore. I mean, sure, I could say you can trust the Linux kernel for sure. You can trust the Linux kernel because Linus Torvalds, the creator of Linux, is in charge of it. And you can bet he's not going to let crap like that go through. And there are plenty of official distributions that you can trust. Canonical's not going to let crap get into Ubuntu. SUSE's not going to let crap get into OpenSUSE. Red Hat's not going to let crap get into Fedora. The developers of Linux Mint, they're solid people. Bodhi Linux, solid people. The elementary people, heck yeah. Everybody else, well, Zorin OS, yes. And of course, like I said, there's a, there are other distributions that aren't major, but are still trustworthy. But just be careful out there. When you find a Linux distribution that looks interesting to you, do a little research. Before you install it, do a little research. I hate to have to be the bearer of those tidings, but I just hate where we are right now. Where you've got to be diligent with everything or somebody's going to walk away with all you have. Now, I know, I know it sounds paranoid. And I don't want to seem that pessimistic. It's just better to be safe than sorry. Again, Linux is safe. Linux is secure. Linux is powerful, flexible, and user-friendly. You just have to be careful with those obscure distributions. Bummer. Anyway, that's my Linux 101 special entry for the day. It's almost the holidays. Woohoo! Merry whatever. Happy whatever. Anyway, thank you again for listening to me blather on about Linux because, you know, I love Linux. I've been loving Linux for a very, very long time. Anyway, I hope that you and everyone you know and love have a wonderful, wonderful day.